One may begin, I suggest, by asking a fundamental question. What's the role of law? In earlier generations, questions like that were easily answered. The role of law was understood as being to maintain order and to flagellate evildoers. The common law of England was strongly influenced by Christianity and St Paul had described the secular authorities as God's agents of punishment. The early writings on the common law had a strong religious flavour. One famous English judge, Lord Eldon, thought that Christianity was actually part of the law of England, though not everyone would have warmed to his conception of Christianity. And Lord Eldon opposed laws that abolished slavery, closed the debtors' prisons and permitted Roman Catholics to vote. Uh, he reportedly wept in court when reported that the death penalty would no longer be available for petty theft. Uh, his lordship was said to have thought that an ordered universe was shivering into fragments. The blessings of this religious uh, influence were not always apparent to litigants. Early English legal procedures were often brutal and unfair. Courts relied upon divine intervention to arrive at the truth. Wealthy or noble-born litigants would be permitted to call upon their peers to swear that their cause was just, and it was assumed that this was reliable because they wouldn't dare risk divine punishment for perjury. Others were not so lucky. The alternative was proof by ordeal. This was based on the expectation that God would intervene to reveal the truth in a more tangible manner. There were various forms of ordeal. One required a litigant to hold a red-hot iron or plunge his hand into boiling water. If his hand had not festered within three days, he was deemed innocent. Uh, it's not clear whether screaming was regarded as an admission of guilt. The cold water ordeal involved binding an accused person and throwing him into a river or pond. If he floated, he was obviously guilty and could be hung or burnt to death. Uh, if he had the good fortune to sink, he'd be declared innocent. Of course, he probably would have drowned by being vindicated. A good man was a dead man, as a medieval feminist might have said. Uh, but then, uh, regrettably, it was mainly women who fell foul of this procedure when it was revived during the witch hunts that later spread through Europe. The Norman innovation of trial by battle offered the defendant the tantalising prospect of surviving. All he had to do was kill or maim his adversary or keep fighting until the sun came out and any fool would be able to see that he was innocent. It was not a procedure uh, for the faint-hearted. Uh, one report of a contest in the 12th century reveals that a knight who'd been beaten to the ground and was on the brink of losing was able to recover and demonstrate the justice of his cause by tearing off his opponent's testicles. The attending clergy may have found that robust demonstration of, of the Almighty's intervention spiritually uplifting, but they mercifully had declined to incorporate the, the root right into their regular Anglican liturgies. Women were permitted to have champions, and as time went by, wealthy men who weren't all that sure that the Almighty would be impressed by their righteousness followed suit, and they themselves took up champions. Uh, if a distressed damsel decided that she wanted to fight her own battle, she was free to do that, and gender equity would be ensured by requiring the man to fight with one arm tied and standing into a pit up to his waist. Of course, the good times couldn't last. Trial by jury emerged as the preferred system of justice. Some defendants refused to cooperate by pleading guilty or not guilty, as the case may be, and they developed a new procedure called the Pine Forte Dure, which was intended to make the person change his mind and plead. That involved piling large rocks onto a person's body until he changed his mind. Uh, this too was defended upon the basis of religious conviction. Uh, it, uh, an early report uh, stated that even if the defendant was pressed to death, this was good for the soul, provided he bore it with resignation. You can see why we have such a wonderful heritage of, of British justice that we need to maintain. Fortunately, Western societies gradually stopped drowning defendants, skewering them with broadswords or squashing them with rocks. Uh, although there are some neoconservatives in America who I'm sure would be, la would be dying to see them reinstated. Medieval concepts such as the divine right of kings were replaced by the rule of law the principle that it is the law itself that governs our conduct and that all of us, including those in government, are bound by it. We still look to the law for the maintenance of order, 
but we also see its role as involving the maintenance of our rights and freedoms. As our societies emerged from feudal concepts of earlier years, there was increasing recognition of the rights of the individual. As early as 1215, the Magna Carta recorded King John's reluctant proclamation, to no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. More than five centuries later, the American Declaration of Independence famously affirmed that all men are created equal and all are endowed with their by their creator uh, with certain inalienable rights, including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then in 1789, America amended its constitution to guarantee that anyone prosecuted for a criminal offence would enjoy the rights to a speedy trial by an impartial jury, the right to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted by witnesses against him, to have compulsory processes for com uh, obtaining witnesses in his favour, and to have the assistance of counsel. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen followed in 1793. And those kinds of rights characterised our, pub our, our democracies to a degree for 200 years. Of course, they were applied selectively. Not everyone was keen to acknowledge that the Creator had bestowed equal rights on women or slaves, yet the underlying principles were sound. Nor were they seen as luxuries to be jettisoned when danger threatened. In fact, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 reflected the world's reaction to the horrendous acts of genocide committed during the Holocaust and an international consensus that no one should ever again be denied such basic human rights. Some of these rights, I regret to say, are now being eroded. The principal culprits have been politicians beating the law and order drum. They tell us they will be tough on crime, as though this is a new concept rather than that one that they and their opponents have been harping on for years. They imply for past, that past tolerance for weakness has been responsible for all of society's present problems. They use martial metaphors like the war on drugs, and they have little patience for any suggestion that complicated social problems involve profoundly difficult issues and that toughness might be a not be a panacea for all ills. They're aided and abetted by journalists who paint a, a verbal pictures of a simplistic world in which anyone should be able to identify the goodies and the baddies, and the only question it needs to ask is why the baddies aren't locked up. Any shock jock with an eye for a ratings can tell you what's wrong. It's all the fault of the bleeding hearts, the people who raise tedious questions about civil liberties, oppose mandatory sentencing, object to uh, children being imprisoned when they deserve it, and think mental illness should be an excuse when justice requires a firm hand. Zero tolerance is the answer, they say. Lock them up and throw away the key. If that doesn't work, there's always the death penalty. How can you have a civilised society if you're not prepared to kill people? I had that proposition put to me almost in those words on Talkback Radio yesterday. The rhetoric has been shallow and misleading. Despite public perception to the contrary, crime rates have been generally falling and sentences have been becoming more and more heavy. But it has struck increasingly responsive chords, especially since the threat of terrorism emerged. We've constantly been told that we now live in a new world and that old standards can no longer be sustained. This is a specious but seductive argument. The horror of terrorist attacks is certainly inescapable. It's revealed with excruciating clarity by television coverage that seemingly transports the bloodied bodies of the slain and the shock anguish of the survivors into our own living rooms. We no longer have the emotional insulation of learning of these things only through the written word. We can see the blood on the pavement and the smoke in the air. We can hear the screams of the wounded and watch people writhing on the ground. We're confronted by the agony of parents vainly trying to make some sense of the death of their children. The carnage has intruded into our lives and horror and fear have become part of our own reality. Our American friends have responded to this by substantially abandoning many of the principles that they had previously insisted would be defended to the last foxhole. All people are no longer endowed by the Creator with rights to liberty. The theology of the Declaration of Independence has been supplanted by the neoconservative heresy that the Creator has only bestowed such rights upon Americans, and even those are not inalienable. <laughs>
arrest without charge, imprisonment without trial, cruel and degrading treatment, and the attempted creation of a law-free zone at Guantanamo Bay, all became part of the new regime. In essence, a nation that had long been a beacon of hope to those seeking freedom in other parts of the world had decided that people should be confined in a concentration camp for years on end without charge. It was sufficient that an unknown official thought that they must have done something wrong, even if unable to articulate what it might have been. America rationalises the substantial abandonment of its founding principles by the contention that it's actually at war with Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and, quote, associated forces, unquote. Hence, any whom it can classify as enemy combatants may be held indefinitely without trial until the war is ended. This sophistry is contrary to international law, but its sinister implications have not been dispelled by the Obama administration. In early 2009, Obama's nominees for the position of Attorney General and Solicitor General both agreed that if someone were captured in the Philippines and were suspected of financing al-Qaeda, that person would be considered, quote, part of the battlefield, unquote. In other words, anyone anywhere in the world may be arrested on mere suspicion and kept in prison f until they die. While they might now be treated more humanely, they should not expect a fair trial or indeed any trial. Nor was this moral abdication confined to America. The Howard government in Australia almost fell over its collective feet in the rush to support the decision to keep two Australian citizens imprisoned at Guantanamo Bay. We were told that it was too dangerous to permit them to come to court and receive a proper trial. President Bush described David Hicks as amongst the worst of the world, worst. Yet when finally charged, the offence to which he was asked to plead was in, involved in essence training with Al-Qaeda, carrying out surveillance, being issued with weapons, minding a tank, and spending two hours on the front line before changing his mind and fleeing. He was hardly Al-Qaeda's answer to Adolf Hitler. An earlier generation reacted quite differently when at the end of World War II it emerged that at least six million men, women and children had been brutally murdered in the Holocaust. There were no flat screen televisions in those days to, to convey the carnage into Western living rooms in living colour. But our grandparents watched graphic footage of newsreels and they saw mass graves and skeletal remains being bulldozed into them. The magnitude of this horror was unimaginable. And yet even after a global war, the world recoiled from the discovery of such evil, but it adhered to its principles. It insisted that Nazi war criminals be given fair trials in open court. Even when Adolf Eichmann was captured by the State of Israel and charged with complicity in the murder of several million Jews, a Jewish state brought him to trial within 11 months of his capture and broadcast the proceedings live to the world so everyone could see he was being treated fairly. Did anyone, does anyone really believe that people like David Hicks were more frightening than people like Adolf Eichmann and Rudolf Hess? Or have we, as a gen current, do we in this current generation simply lack the moral courage of earlier generations? Are we no longer willing to defend rights and principles in the same way as our parents and grandparents did? Many Australians might be surprised to learn that people here in this country may det be detained and held in custody without being suspected of any crime, and even more surprised to learn that members of their family may be sent to prison for mentioning their detention. Suppose, for example, that a mother is informed that her teenage daughter is being held under a preventative detention order to preserve evidence. The mother is permitted to tell the teenager's father only that she's safe but unable to be contacted for the time being. The father panics and, and asks, does that mean she's been kidnapped? Well, all I can tell you, the mother says, is that she's safe but can't be contacted for the time being. You're holding things back from me. She must have been kidnapped. The father starts to rush out the door and the mother says, look, hang on, I'll tell you the truth. She's just being held by AZA for questioning. The mother's just committed an offence for which she can go to prison for five years. That's under Australian law. And it's a current law which has not been changed by the Rudd government. Some state governments have now jumped on the bandwagon and introduced draconian laws unrelated to terrorism. 
The South Australian Attorney General may now make declarations effectively banning particular organisations if satisfied that their members associate for the purpose of serious criminal activity and that the organisations present a risk to public safety and order. The Attorney General must act on the advice of the Police Commissioner but is not obliged to provide any reasons and his decision is not subject to any appeal. Indeed, it can't be called into question in any court. The laws are supposed to be aimed at bikey gangs, but the Act doesn't mention bikey gangs at all. Declarations can be made against any, any organisation, so long as the Attorney General holds the requisite belief, however ill-conceived. If he uh, is misled or if he abuses the power by, say, banning an organisation that just happens to have been critical of police corruption in his state, uh, then those affected have no legal re redress. And other states have now flocked to join the crowd. Last year, the Western Australian Government announced that police will be given new powers to stop and search people and vehicles in declared areas, even if not reasonably suspected of any wrongdoing. Why? Why should our children be harassed if there are not even grounds to suspect that they might have done something wrong? Western Australia also has mandatory detention laws that apply to children as young as 10. A child who has been found guilty of burglary for a second time must be incarcerated for at least a year, even if emotionally disturbed or fleeing from sexual abuse. Is this still part of Australia? The government of this state announced in March this year that it will reverse the onus of proof when people are charged with possession of knife and given an on-the-spot fine. The Premier said that those found carrying knives would be presumed guilty until proven innocent. Why? A chef, scouts and others like my dear old dad who always liked to have a pen knife with him uh, to be denied rights that we accord to serial killers and rapists and child molesters? The suggestion that the reversal of the onus of proof is necessary to permit the operation of an on-the-spot fine system is simply nonsense. Uh, and it sets a disturbing precedent. Are we to see other laws based upon the presumption that we're all guilty unless we prove our innocence? There has also been a trend towards permitting reliance upon criminal intelligence, which is a euphemism for opinions held by police officers based upon undisclosed material that may be highly unreliable. In some cases, people may have their liberty curtailed by control orders without even knowing what they're supposed to have done. Last week, uh, earlier this week indeed, we deported a man who'd lived peacefully in Australia for 16 years. Why did we do that? Well, Big Brother declined to tell us. Uh, we are simply asked to trust that there must be a reason somewhere because ASIO thought it was a good idea. Uh, <coughs> Be careful not to antagonise a cranky or mentally unbalanced neighbour because his anonymous phone call might be enough to constitute uh, criminal intelligence and you might be surprised to find orders made against you that you simply can't understand. Some of our current policies have actually made things worse rather than better. The problem is that we've sold our birthright for a mess of pottage and the, and the pottage has been rancid. Terrorism is fueled not only by religious extremism, but by notions of honour and revenge. And our recent strategies seem to have been desired, almost with a view to radicalising as many hot-headed young Muslims as possible. In particular, the denial of human rights at Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay continue to provide Al-Qaeda with vivid footage for videos and other visual media that is bound to outrage its intended audience. As Sir John Major, the former, former Conservative Prime Minister of England, has observed, if our own standards fail, it will serve to recruit terrorists more effectively than their own propaganda ever could. Other policies have needlessly endangered lives. Perhaps the most obvious example is the opposition to measures intended to reduce the risk of death due to illegal drug usage. The first needle exchange program in Australia was introduced in 1986, only when medical staff at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney were moved to break the law after government approval was repeatedly withheld. Within months there were government run programs in all Australian states and a report commissioned by the Commonwealth Department of Health has estimated that by this year these programs will have saved the lives of more than four and a half thousand people who would otherwise have died from AIDS and Hepatitis C.
They cost, incidentally, less than $150 million and in the long run have saved more than $7 billion. The first medically in, uh, supervised injecting centre was opened in 1999, a year in which more than 1,100 young Australians died of heroin overdoses. This again occurred, occurred only when concerned people, people felt obliged to break the law. The current centre in Sydney has a res been a resounding success. In the first six years, it managed more than 2,100 overdose-related events. Many young people would have died had the overdoses occurred elsewhere, such as in back alleys or in private houses where they could shoot up without risk of being arrested. But in fact, every one of those 2,106 young people survived. Medical advice and care was also provided, and drug users were referred to other services for treatment, including drug rehabilitation, on more than 6,000 occasions, more than 1,000 a year. At least 28 other rigorous studies have shown that such facilities have reduced overdoses and produced other health-related benefits, including increased uptake of detoxification and treatment programs without leading to increases in drug-related crime or rates of relapse. Yet there's still opposition. I understand you still don't have such a centre here in Melbourne. Why? The most common response is that it sends the wrong message to our young people. There's, it, it's one of the fantasies that people uh, seem to have. There seems to be this view that 12, 13 and 14 year olds at parties offer joints uh, or other drugs routinely say, no, look, I can't do that because I'm sure that if this wasn't dangerous, those nice people who wear suits and swan around in Canberra and make our laws would have changed the law. Um, if anybody's ever met such a young person, perhaps they could tell me afterwards, because I've been involved in dealing with drug addicts in one form or another for more than 35 years and I've never met one. Uh, the, the other fantasy that is harboured is that the world is just full of young people who never take drugs because they're illegal and who are champing at the bit for the day they'll be legalised so they can rush into the first pharmacy and get their legal heroin. In reality, adolescents offered their first taste of forbidden narcotic fruit and not deterred by the absence of adequate public health programs. And one has to ask a fundamental question. And I so wish that every politician in Australia would address this question on frontline television before continuing to defend the status quo. How many as young Australians should be allowed to die each year for the sake of an imaginary message? I haven't heard any politician prepared to address that question yet, and I'm not holding my breath. Our children, oh, let me start again. The rights of ordinary Australians are being progressively eroded by politicians who sometimes seem unable to understand that our laws apply to everyone, and that provisions that are intended to undermine the rights of people who we think may be criminals or we think may be terrorists will also undermine our rights and they'll undermine the rights of our children, and they'll undermine the rights of our grandchildren. And because Australia has no Bill of Rights, courts will be powerless to strike those laws down, and very often powerless to avoid the injustice that they may cause. Our children and our grandchildren will inherit their places in societies that are shaped by the decisions that we make today. I am sure that they, like us, will want to be safe, but they also want to enjoy the rights and the privileges that should be their birthright. They may look back to us with pride and with gratitude, or they may wince at our cowardice in the face of danger and begin a long struggle to regain what we were too frightened to defend. It may require courage to be the voice of reason in the face of vehement demands for drastic action, but in the long run, it will be those who stand against the tide and who insist on adherence to our values and our principles, who will do the most to ensure that future generations are able to grow up in the free, open and tolerant societies that we inherited in our turn. Thank you. Uh, a Bill of Rights will make, a, will make a lot of difference. We keep hearing a lot about how the evils of a Bill of Rights and how it's taking away the sovereignty of our politicians. 
Sovereignty shouldn't rest with politicians. Sovereignty rests with the people. And the people uh, entrust, the, our, we entrust our elected representatives to make decisions about good governance of our laws. But we're entitled to say, some of our rights we don't want derogated from, even by you. Um, for example, the Constitution has for over 100 years provided that the Commonwealth Government may not take your house without paying for it. Uh, the state government's free to do that because there's no Bill of Rights to prevent it. Uh, why? Is there, does anybody here really want the state government to be free to take their house without paying for it? Uh, why can't we have fundamental principles like the right to a fair trial guaranteed in a Bill of Rights? Nobody's explained that to me. People like Bob Carr, who are vehemently opposed to a Bill of Rights, um, have about three points they make. Uh, first, they seem to assume that uh, any, any single sentence like uh, the state government may not take your property without paying for it will be subjected to enormously vague interpretation if it's in a Bill of Rights. On the other hand, if it's in an ordinary act of parliament, which judges interpret all the time, every day of the week, well, in that case, it would all be, the meaning would be perfectly clear and there wouldn't be a problem about it. Um, the second thing that they seem to assume is that future generations will want to get rid of these rights and they'll be locked in. Well, if uh, my grandchildren want to live in a world in which the Commonwealth government, in which the government can take their property away, in which they will only be allowed to publicly say anything that the government agree with, agrees with, and in which they can be arbitrarily arrested and tortured without having a fair trial, then they would be free to amend the Bill of Rights and, and, and create that kind of society. But I don't see why we can't have it now. Um, the, the arguments to me don't seem to really make a lot of sense. Uh, certainly, a Bill of Rights provides a safeguard. And it's not every uh, infringement of our rights that's intended. Sometimes you get Acts of Parliament that just have a much wider application than anyone intended that the government ever thought about. Um, you know, I remember having an argument with a, with a conservative politician some time ago about mandatory sentencing. He wanted to introduce it for armed robbery. And I said, well, let me tell you of two cases I've just dealt with. One was a case in which um, somebody out, just out on parole had robbed a bank, fired a shot into a woman's head, beside a woman's head, absolutely terrified everyone, and he'd done it just for money. And he went to jail for 12 years. The second was a case where a young girl was charged with armed robbery. She'd been sexually abused as a child throughout her childhood. It had affected her horribly. She'd been unable to cope with the psychiatric, psychological damage, and she'd begun to use heroin to try to cope with the pain of it all. Then she was raped, quite brutally raped. This wasn't a put-up story. The Crown Prosecutor told me they'd arrested and charged the rapist. At that point, she decided she couldn't go on any further and she was going to kill herself, but she couldn't bring herself to cut her wrists and thought the only way to do it was with an overdose of heroin. But she had no money. So she took a syringe of her own blood and she walked into a service station and pointed it at the teller, a uh, man behind the counter, and said, give me some money. I don't want all of it. $200 will be enough. Uh, as I asked the conservative politician, how many years would you require me to send her to prison for? And he said, but we don't mean that kind of case. And that's the problem with a lot of our laws. They're introduced with a particular situation in mind, but they have a wider effect. If you have a Bill of Rights, a judge is able to say, well, plainly, they weren't intending to contravene this fundamental principle, and therefore this fundamental principle applies, and I can do justice in this case. Without it, there's nothing to compare it against. There's, nothing, there's no basis for overruling it. And that's the kind of problem that occurs in Australia as distinct from every other civilised democracy on the world. We're the last one left without a Bill of Rights. I, I think fundamentally the best approach is uh, what we really need, for example, in, in the fight against terrorism is firstly very good intelligence. Uh, that really is the fundamental thing that almost everybody I've spoken to is an expert in that area says the war on terror depends upon. And we do need to take a firm approach to things. I'm not by any means suggesting that uh, if we say sentimental things, uh, the problem will disappear. It won't. But it is vitally important also that we maintain our own standards. 
because when we breach our own standards, not only do we betray the principles that our fought, that earlier generations fought and died to defend, uh, not only do we indicate that we're not really the kind of people that we've held ourselves out to be, but also we play into the enemy's hands. Um, people have often made the comment that to the extent to which we give up our rights, to that extent we have surrendered. We've allowed the terrorists to win and take these things from us. But we also play into their hands by creating a tool for their propaganda. Um, the CIA, for example, uh, opposed the release of further photographs of the abuses of Abu Ghraib uh, on the basis that the photographs that had already been released had caused so many more people to join al-Qaeda. Um, they had inflamed the Muslim world and they'd persuaded so many hot-headed young people uh, that uh, the Western world was corrupt, it was immoral, it was, bi it, it was prejudiced against Muslims and it was waging a war on, on, on Islam. Uh, and, and so it is, I think, very largely a matter of uh, waging a war, if you like to use that martial term, although I'm strongly opposed to it. I don't think we are at war with terrorism. I think that we need to see terrorism as a criminal problem rather than a war. Uh, wars are waged between nations, they're not waged with criminal gangs. But uh, it is absolutely essential that we maintain our principles and that we treat people fairly and are seen to treat people fairly. I, I think that one of the uh, interesting things if you come to look at ethics is the extent to which uh, despite the different backgrounds, you reach common ground on certain basic propositions. Uh, the golden rule, for example, to do unto others as you, do, you would have others do unto you, is a tenet of all of the world's major religions, a tenet of Islam, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism. Uh, and that, it seems to me, is a pretty good starting point. We have uh, these founding documents that I mentioned earlier, such as the uh, early amendments to the American Constitution and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man. We have UN conventions entered into since World War II and in response to the horrors of the Second World War and the Holocaust, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and so forth. And they articulate things that are pretty basic. Uh, they're not talking about airy-fairy left-wing concepts of the kind that keep being attacked by the Bob Cars of the world when they talk about bills of rights, like the right to full employment or the right to, to uh, self-expression or something. Uh, I'm talking about things like um, the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty. Um, that was a right that I always enjoyed. It was a right that all Australians enjoyed going back to the time of Governor Phillip. Uh, the right to a fair trial by an impartial court, um, be tried by judge and jury. Uh, the right to free speech, unless it could be shown that one was inciting racial, racial hatred or uh, uh, showing people how to build nuclear bombs or something of those lines. The, the right to be treated fairly, to not to have cruel and unusual punishments. Um, these, it seems to me, are are simply basic rights to which uh, there is there would be universal assent in Australia. Uh, and I can't understand why it is that our politicians seem to regard them as so potentially seditious. <laughs>